Hello, my name is Omar Obinat. And this is Mariam Sevit. Today, welcome to our uh, third series of EU competition law. And we are talking today about restrictive agreements and abuse of dominant position. Yes. So uh, these two topics are sound to me like general uh, principles that apply in any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. What's uh, what's important to know? Yeah, I mean, for restrictive agreements, I think the most common and most queries that we received is resale price maintenance, which is basically imposing a price or asking a price from your reseller um, to adopt. So in other words, um, I'm a principal and supplier. I have an arrangement with you, Omar, as a distributor, and then you in turn will have an arrangement with your reseller. I cannot impose on you and tell you what to charge an on your reseller. So what, no matter how I want to, um, the law pr prohibits that, and that's a universal approach as well, specifically in the UAE, that I cannot impose those prices that you impose, that you dictate to your uh, resellers. I can only recommend it to you. So when you say recommend, and I've seen this in many uh, contracts where uh, it says that this is the recommended retail price, mm -hmm. but then the contract will say, but if you don't abide by the recommended right. retail price, there will be yes. penalties. There, there are threats. So sometimes you could put on the contract actual resale and then you'll have maybe I can then WhatsApp you and tell you, okay, Omar, but if you you better really abide by the prices or threaten you in another way. So what we see a lot is that maybe officially the contract says it is a recommended resale price, but in essence, the way that parties are performing and the supplier is acting does really show that I'm imposing that on you. I could, for example, give you incentives to absorb, to, to adopt that price, for example. So disguised mm -hmm. uh, RRP recommendations are not really acceptable by the competition law. Absolutely not acceptable. And um, we've we've had also this hurdle in educating as well all our um, other, you know, all the other parties, because um, historically everyone has been doing that. Um, as a commercial practice, it's been common knowledge that, you know, I could basically recommend and also impose a little bit pricing. So it's taking a little bit of a, of time to, for everyone to get in line and to understand that there's been the changes in the law. It's effective now. And the practices that they've been doing for such a long time needs to change. Well, the, the excuse everybody's been doing that, uh, is a common excuse you hear in, uh, in the course of complaints of competition law. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, yes, everybody was doing that mm -hmm. before there was a law. Yeah. Post 2012 and implementing the regulations in 2013, the narrative should have changed. Uh, the issue here is that uh, the competition uh, practice that is uh, uh, th that may not be consistent with Article Five and Article Six of the restrictive agreements. Um, is actually a time bomb. Mm -hmm. This could backlash Correct. at yes. any point of time, is yes. it not? Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, if a principal and a distributor have been uh, imposing uh, in a contract uh, recommended retail price or imposing the actual uh, retail price, um, it doesn't mean that they're both in agreement, then it's fine. Anyone can come back and file a complaint whether the actual distributor or a competitor. We've seen it actually. So this is not a theoretical risk actually. We've seen it. We've had complaints investigated on, you know, emails the authority had to review, um, whereby they're telling them, you know, you really need to adopt um, those prices. Um, and so, yes, the practice is there and uh, the competition authority had, is investigating them when you file, when a complaint is filed, they actually thoroughly react to that and investigate it. So it's no longer a time bomb, meaning that it's happening now. And um, it really needs to be taken into more consideration. So tell me about dominant position. If I'm in a dominant position, I have a market share of 40% or more. Mm -hmm. I have more rules to abide by. Yeah. So some people think that if they're in a dominant position, it means that they're doomed. They can't do anything. So no, it doesn't. You're not automatically in violation of the competition law. If you're in dominant position, you're just under more scrutiny that 
not to abuse your position. So that's why it's called abuse of dominant position. So there's nothing wrong with being in a dominant position, but you need to make sure that you don't abuse that. And the law is very specific, very clear in what they say. And the most common ones that really should be taken into consideration would be basically um, if you are asking not to deal, for example, with a competitor, if you have an agreement and then you tell them specifically in the clause, you know, X should not be dealing with its competitors. If you're in a dominant position, that's under scrutiny. Um, another matter is, for example, if uh, you have an agreement and you have a little uh, bunch of resellers and they all have similar commercial terms, you are not allowed to discriminate between them because once you discriminate, you being in a dominant position, you actually impact the competition between the resellers. So there's a little bit more uh, scrutiny on them, such as, for example, predatory pricing, not to have really to, you know, to have the prices very low so then you can impact on the market. So it's basically to take into consideration. And what we always say to companies that your market share can change and evolve. So what was your market share last year may not necessarily be your market share this here and we always recommend companies to keep a close eye on their market share well i mean you talking here about restrictive agreements predatory pricing rrp sounds like a heavy topic I, I think this is not something that uh sales distributors uh, uh, marketing people are uh, well aware of mm -hmm. uh, and probably calls for uh, uh training and compliance uh training with a competition law what would what is your recommendation to clients yeah so our recommendation is always to have a yearly minimum once or twice a year competition law training um specifically for certain uh, consumer facing uh, employees so obviously the marketing team needs to as well be uh, well educated on the rules on what they can market what they can advertise um you have also rules related to uh competition to disclosing uh, discussing with competitors so basically the team that actually maybe deal with other competitors on a friendly basis, they need to have the do's and don'ts on how they can approach and how can they deal with competitors. Um, so training in general for compliance is absolutely crucial. Well, there you have it. Um, the uh, excuse that others are doing it uh, doesn't fly with the competition law. Training and compliance with competition law is very important mm -hmm. and awareness and at least once a year you mentioned. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for joining us in our uh, third session of the UAE Competition Law Series and hope to see you with our next series. Thank you.